Okay, sounds great. Well, I want to welcome everyone to uh, to our first meeting of the Mono Basin Historical Society for 2022. So, uh, Happy New Year to everyone. And I wanted to take a minute to thank everyone for sending in their remember whens that I asked for from the uh, from the newsletter. Um, what we plan on doing is publishing them in our next newsletter. And uh, it's, it's really fun to see. Um, you know, we were sort of inspired with the Remember When poem that uh, we reprinted in the, news, in the newsletter of Elma Flavors that was originally done in 1991. And when I spoke with uh, Elma's daughter-in-law, Marsha Blaver, she said that this could be the beginning of a snapshot of the lives of many who resided in our little village and Mono Basin. So please, if you have any memories to share, uh, if you could send them to the Curator uh, mailbox at curator at monobasinhistory.org, that would be awesome. And we'll compile them and put them in the next newsletter. But I thought what might be fun is just to read off a couple of them now and then. And it's interesting how we have mm -hmm. like memories. So uh, came, this one came from Shelley Channel. And he said he remembers when they moved the sheep through town on the highway. And then Sally Gaines sent in, I remember when 395 was two lanes and traffic would have to stop to let a herd of sheep cross from one side to the other. So that was pretty neat. They were so close. Um, just another little announcement for folks that uh, are, are uh, maybe around in, in the basin. Uh, Lily, ba Lily Matthew, uh, celebrated her 99th birthday last week. So um, if anyone wants, yes. <laughs> if anyone would like to just uh, stop by or send her a note, I'm sure she'd really appreciate it. Let's see, um, I wanted to thank everyone for sending in uh, trustee election ballots. Our new board members are Dave Carl and Bob Marks, and they will be joining Rich Foy Carrie Kellogg, Barry McPherson, Janice Mendez, and Chris Spiller. And our trustees are going to have their first meeting of the year on Thursday. And thank you to all the trustees for investing your time. We really appreciate it. Rich, is Chris, is uh, Chris Lietza on? Oh, I do see him. So I think now we're gonna turn it over to Chris for a year end report, financial report. My goodness, I'm on the spot. You got well, it. The State of the Union is excellent, I will say. Um, and I kind of prepared a report and shared it with um, Robin because I have email difficulties. But um, uh, to make a long story short, we have just under $35,000 in our coffers at this time. And um, uh, our, you know, we, we keep growing because COVID has limited our employment. Um, expenses. Our employment last year was under $3,000, our, our payroll, I should say. Um, and uh, so, you know, we budget 15000 for that and only spend 3000 So that's um, a large reason why we keep um, uh, uh, replacing all the funds that we are so good at spending with these projects. Um, at any rate, our retail sales um, were strong and just under $5,000. With the cost of goods, um, uh, about 1,500 of that. So um, our sales are going good. Uh, but most importantly, we really um, uh, we've really entered the 21st century and, and beyond, um, using uh, Stripe and Square for our internet sales and our credit card processing. And um, you know, I think we've got a good handle on that. We've also, you know, for years I was using QuickBooks Payroll that I was bootlegging from the market. Um, so once I sold the market, we had to figure out another way to do payroll without expending the, um, you know, the, the QuickBooks payroll feature would have cost us close to a thousand bucks a year. And we didn't really want to do that. So I found um, Gusto. Uh, and this is the first year we're using that. And so I'm still learning and learning about the expense of it. And it's proving to be very successful. And they, um, I, I still have to uh, send in the state forms myself, but that's really easy, but they're doing all the federal forms and um, and I actually got our W-2s out in time this year. And um, 
uh, so uh, everything is going really well and uh, we have one more goal for the spring and that's to to um, tighten up our register operations and um, uh, with Robin um, has been helping me properly categorize some of the donations and memberships so we have a better handle on that and uh, the report shows that uh, that membership uh, memberships are down slightly, but I don't think that's correct. I think it's just because we're accounting for them better, dividing memberships and donations, uh, which are about 50-50 uh, our, on our income side. Um, other donations were about $6,000 in membership dues were about, uh, were exactly $5,000 from last year. So um, last year, I think we showed about 7,500 in membership dues, but I think that's an accounting um, adjustment. I don't think we have uh, membership dues or any less. Um, I think our membership um, uh, membership drive was very successful this fall. So um, uh, yeah, I'll I'll provide a, a full report to everyone as soon as I figure out my email problem, and and we'll be due for a budget meeting coming up. Uh, and if anyone ever has any questions, feel free to email me or give me a call. Okay, anything else, Chris? Is that it? Um, I think that's it. Thank you. Thank you. And um, really, really thank you, Chris. Uh, it's just amazing. You know, even a society that is the size of ours, still all the rules and regulations come into play. And Chris has just been invaluable. We really, really appreciate Appreciate it, Chris. Thank you so much. Thank you. Uh, before we um, go on to tonight's presentation, I just wanted to uh, go over what we've got coming up. And Dave, Carl, we might need you to chime in if I've got any of these wrong. But uh, next month in March, we have Steve Moore, who is a, um, a retired ranger, and he is doing Remembering a Bodhi Adventure. It's from his time spent in Bodhi as a ranger. And then in April, we have Cole Hawkins. And uh, Cole, what, what is your um, title of your presentation? Or Well, it's Food in the Mono Basin. I can't come up with a better title than that. I like that. They all like food. Mm -hmm. Hungry. Yeah. I started out, I was going to start out talking about produce from the ranches, but things change and it's going to be about food. I'm going to talk about uh, markets and uh, restaurants and farms and gardens and co-ops and you name it. If it's got something to do with food, I'm going to try to get it in there. That sounds great. And then in May, we've got David Woodruff. And David is always good with us, some Tales Along 395. And June 6th is Scott Stein. Dave, Carl, or unless Scott's on, do you think, know, what is? Uh, so, am I, yeah, I'm, I'm unmuted. Scott is a um, geographer who's worked um, for decades um, uh, in the Mono Basin doing research, and um, I can't remember what he told me he wanted to talk about. I think he wanted to talk about um, early history um, in, the, in the basin, but I, honestly, I can't remember, but it'll be good. He's, uh, he's a very uh, knowledgeable and dynamic guy, and if we can meet in person, I think that would be cool. Uh, same with Coles. I, you know, there ought to be food at a meeting like the topic that Cole's doing. So and there ought to be rocks or something if we're going to do for, for Scott Steins. All right. Well, and then uh, Rich Foy is going to uh, uh, do a presentation in July. And we still have some open time. So if anyone out there is interested in doing a presentation, we'd sure love to have you reach out either to the curator at monobasinhistory.org or to Dave Carl, who seems like a one-man band when it comes to putting these together, at davidcarlbooks at gmail.com. Right, Dave? Yes. Okay. Okay, let's see. Um, 
We're going to get ready to, uh, to start the presentation. I wanted to let everyone know that if you have any comments or questions, if you put them in the chat, then we'll go ahead and, um, and go over those at the end and Barry can uh, answer questions. So this month's presentation is being uh, presented by Barry McPherson and it is Broken Dreams. W.D. McPherson from Rush Creek to Paoa Island. So take it away, Barry. Well, thank you for the introduction, Robin. Yes, um, good to see everyone. Uh, and I want to say that this is a repeat of the presentation I gave at the Ghost uh, last summer at Mono Inn. However, I'm excited about making it, uh, making the presentation again this time with photos and without a Coleman lantern to light my paper so I can read <laughs> read my text. I am going to be reading uh, my text, so I'll be looking down a little bit and hopefully you'll still be able to hear me okay. Um, but um, yes, Barry Preston McPherson, youngest grandchild of the man whose impact on Mono Basin history I'm going to tell you about. Um, I'm actually going to go on beyond uh, Peoa Island uh, to uh, Mono Inn as well. So I want to start with some uh, expressions of gratitude. And I'm going to share screen at this point. <clears throat> Slide show. There we go. Okay. Um, my sister Vanita McPherson Jorgensen from Riverside is on the Zoom tonight. She helped me greatly in researching uh, material for this talk. Vanita and I lived uh, with our parents and our brother Wally in the middle house down below Mono Inn. Um, that was my grandmother, Vanita McPherson's uh, resort. She gave that house to our father, Wallace R. McPherson, when he married um, Virginia Barry of Wyoming in 1944. We lived there quite happily until 1961 when we moved up to Conway Summit where dad was foreman for the uh, Division of Highways. In the late 1990s, my wife Denise and I inherited that house along with the two uh, houses on either side and all the McPherson property on the west shore of the lake except for Mono Inn and 10 acres around it. They had sold Mono Inn and surrounding property decades earlier. <clears throat> I love, okay, and I want to uh, thank um, uh, Professor Emeritus uh, Bob Marks for his uh, assistance with this. He provided a lot of information. He's a he's an actual researcher in history, <laughs> unlike uh, unlike me. Um, he was from Whittier College in the Los Angeles area. Um, he gave a talk on this subject at the Ghost event last August and in a Zoom presentation at the October meeting of the Historical Society. Those talks included a lot of uh, information about J.B. Clover, who bought my grandfather's failing irrigation project and kept digging the ditch. Dr. Marks and his wife, Joyce Kaufman, also a professor at Whittier College, live in June Lake now. And we are very happy that um, Bob has now joined the Board of Trustees for the Historical Society. Thanks to David Carl, for asking me to talk about my grandfather and his irrigation project for the ghost. Preparing for that talk and this presentation tonight led me to learn a great deal about my grandfather and unlearn many erroneous things about him and Mono Basin history. My grandfather Wallace Daniel McPherson was a man whose dreams were broken in this basin, yet he left some, left some important marks here. He died at age 80 in Los Angeles without my sister, brother, or me having ever met him. Our father and grandmother told us very little about him and didn't save much information for us. So what I have to tell you is a bit limited. 
I prefer to call him WD to help distinguish him from my father, Wallace Raish McPherson, and my older brother, Wallace Vital McPherson. WD may have been known as Wallace or Wally uh, to some people. As I have said in past presentations, um, you're about to hear my version of history, and it's surely not 100% accurate. I try, but I'm surprised at all the inconsistencies I find and even create in dates and the spellings of names in particular. I love the words of uh, Marion uh, Randall Parsons of Parsons Memorial Lodge, Walmy Meadows fame, and a friend of John Muir way back. She used to stay in a cabin next to ours at Mona Lake for part of many summers to paint landscapes. In her 1952 book, Old California Houses, she writes this wonderful truth. Many stories about early California are alternately asserted and denied and are often impossible to verify. Even the person, personal recollections of pioneers, too often written years after the events they record, are frequently erroneous in their dates and facts. <laughs> so, Keeping that perspective in mind, I'm here to tell you a story. Wallace Daniel McPherson was born in 1872 in Fayetteville, Cal Fayetteville, Alabama. Wait a minute. For some reason it's going backwards. Okay, I've got the right button here, I think. Wallace Daniel McPherson was born in 1872 in Fayetteville, Alabama to William G. McPherson and Sinai Wallace, Wallace ending in the letters I-S, not A-C-E. He had no siblings and his parents moved to the San Francisco Bay Area in 1877 when he was only five years old. W.D. attended schools in Oakland and perhaps San Jose and San Francisco where his mother taught school. He studied electrical engineering at Stanford University from 1893 to 1896. He left before graduating to pursue a dream of making a good living as a mining engineer. W.D. began his mining engineer on the west slope of the Sierra Nevada with the Guggenheim Mining Interest Company around 1896. He came to the Mono Basin as a mining engineer sometime in the late 1890s to early 1900s, and perhaps the future U.S. President Herbert Hoover's brother was one of the reasons. We don't know if W.D. actually knew Herbert Hoover and his older brother, Theodore Hoover, but they both obtained degrees from Stanford University about the same time in the 1890s. Theodore Hoover also studied engineering and became a mining engineer like W.D. Theodore Hoover was manager of the Standard Mill in Bodie from 1902 to 1905 and his home still stands in the ghost town. W.D. held um, numerous uh, positions around Mono Basin in mining, Lundy, Bodie, and nearby Aurora, Nevada. For a time, he was employed by the very rich and powerful man J.S. Kane in the standard consolidated mining company of Bodie. Kane was 19 years older than W.D., born in 1853, died in 1938. After working for uh, J.S. Kane at the Standard Mill in Bodie, W.D. switched his interest to agriculture in about 1909 for reasons unknown to me. He worked at convincing various government agencies to support his irrigation ideas trying to overcome their skepticism and get decisions helpful to his irrigation plan. The first big dream was to divert water from Rush Creek around the Mono Craters and out to the volcanic soils area below Mono Mills. His dream was to provide water for 60,000 acres of agriculture in a town near the Bodie Railway and Lumber Company that was hauling Jeffrey Pine lumber and firewood up to the boom, boom town of Bodie. Farms, ranches, and a town would be financially successful because of trade with Bodie over the existing railway. He dreamed of a road 
if not a railroad, from the new agricultural area out of the basin and south to the Owens Valley at Benton Station on the Carson and Colorado Railway. That was a narrow gauge railroad running from Carson City, Nevada, down through western Nevada, and then down through the Owens Valley. Other dreamers did groundwork for a railroad, railroad they called the Bodie and Benton Railway to run from Mono Lake over the mountains to Benton Station. It would connect with the existing railway running between Mono Mills and Bodie at a point near Warm Springs on the lakeshore, but it was never built. In 1912, WD formed the Rush Creek Mutual Ditch Company and two related companies. The Mono Valley Improvement Company was responsible for digging the ditch, and the Sierra Land and Water Company was a public utility corporation that would appropriate the water uh, to sell for public use. WD was the president and chief construction engineer. This was called a mutual ditch company because it sold shares to people in order to generate capital for the construction of the ditch, which would then supply water to the shareholders who planned to obtain land through the Desert Land Act of 1877. Different than the Homestead Act of 1862, which was first intended to help with reformation of the South after the Civil War, the Desert Land Act required application of water to the land and growing of crops on 320 acres for a single person or 640 acres for a married couple for at least three years. Water to irrigate would often come from an external source. It was WD's dream that people would then profit from farms, ranches, transportation, and a town by being shareholders in his ditch company and getting water from the ditch company. Around 1909, he met Venita Eugenia Raich. She was the only child of Vital Caton Raich and Mary Hanbury Raich, May Hanbury Raich on the ranch they homesteaded between Bishop and Big Pine near Klondike Lake, which is just east of the present day Highway 395. Benita's father, Vital, had been superintendent of the Copper World Mine at Manville, California. Perhaps because of this, WD may have gotten to know Vital before meeting uh, Vital's daughter, Benita. WD and Benita were married in Los Angeles in 1913 he being 41 and she being 25. In 1916, WD engineered the first road out of Mono Lake Basin to Benton Station. This road became known as McPherson Grade. It started in the flats north of Mono Mills and climbed through um, some switchbacks up to Indian Springs and over the mountains to Benton Station. Later on, Highway 120 was built going on the south side of Mono Mills <clears throat> and joining WD's road near the 8,000 foot summit close to Gas Pipe Spring. <clears throat> McPherson Grade fell into disrepair, but some maps still show this road as McPherson Grade. The steepest section through the switchbacks is now impassable due to rock slides and brush. McPherson Grade is a lasting visible mark that WD left on the basin, though it is no longer very functional. Ditch Company used capital generated from selling shares in the ditch and its water to purchase a big shovel. This was a, um, they, they purchased a shovel in about 1915 in order to help build the ditch. This shovel, which was one of the first gasoline powered shovels, not a steam shovel, is preserved next to the Mono Basin History Museum in Levine. project a ditch. It was something many of us today would call a canal because of its size, 30 feet wide 
and 15 feet deep. Maybe anything smaller than the Erie Canal was considered a ditch in that time of play. But it wasn't long before WD's Rush Creek Mutual Ditch Company ran into legal trouble. WD had a running battle with his former employer, J.S. Kane, over water rights. Kane's alternative plan for water in all major tributaries flowing into the lake was to use the water to generate electricity to sell locally and all the way to Southern California. He was very early in the electricity business, having built a dam and hydro plant on Green Creek near Bridgeport to run electricity to his big mining operation in Bodie. He had already been involved in getting Mill Creek plant below Lundy Lake. Pool plant on Levining Creek. One very close to Mono Lake at the mouth of Rush Creek. This slide shows that if he dammed the creek up here at Rush Creek uh, Narrows near the confluence with Walk Walker Creek, he could get about 300 feet of head from there down uh, to the mouth of Rush Creek near Mono Lake. This would be done through a, pen, a dam at the Narrows and a penstock carrying the water parallel to the creek down to the powerhouse. <clears throat> the powerhouse where Rush Creek cascades down to Silver Lake seemed to have little to do with the conflict because running water through that powerhouse would not remove water and it would, and that water would flow on to be diverted to agricultural land between Grant Lake and Mono Lake. Cain was deceptive. Plan to use the water to make money from electricity generated by his hydroelectric plant, plant along plants along the creek. He ran large amounts of Rush Creek water out into areas where there was were no crops, just sagebrush, in order to show use and keep his water rights for later use in a hydropower scheme. WD had considerable communication with government officials as he tried to expose Kane's false claims and waste of water. It became a contentious mess. Sorry, eyes are wearing down, need my glasses. <laughs> Professor Rob, Robert Marks has made a presentation um, to the Historical Society on this mess last October. And there is a record of that presentation on the Historical Society website as a YouTube. To summarize, WD had made appropriation claims to the water by posting notices on trees, posts, whatever was near the banks of Rush Creek, and filing these claims with Mono, the Mono County government, a legal practice in that day. But he had posted his main claim where he would divert water into his big ditch on what turned out to be the inside corner of private land owned by Joseph Farrington, not on unclaimed land. It was less than a mile downstream from today's Grant Lake Dam. I show in this picture, um, this graphic, Grant Lake Reservoir up here, the water going to LA Aqueduct goes behind this uh, sign and on towards the craters. But then there's a return ditch nowadays that brings the water back uh, to Rush Creek. There's just a dry channel from the dam down to where the return ditch puts the water back into Rush Creek. And it's just below there where WD had his head gate. Rush Creek continues on to the right and around here where you see all the good trees and riparian vegetation. It's hard to find, but you can find some of the remains of the Rush Creek Mutual Ditch long here flowing below the, um, the return ditch, LADWP's return ditch. <clears throat> Soon, J.S. Kane owned most of the land bordering Rush Creek, the riparian land, between the undammed Grant Lake and Mono Lake, and he had established riparian water rights to this land. 
In June or July of 1914, Kane filed a suit that challenged WD's appropriation water claims in Mono County Superior Court. <clears throat> On July 11th, 1914, Kane, knowing the judge well and full of confidence that the decree was forthcoming, got a court injunction calling for WD to halt the diverting of water. The county sheriff's office delivered the injunction and Kane immediately had his men tear out the head gate on Rush Creek, cutting off any chance of water flowing into uh, Rush Creek Mutual Ditch Company's ditch. Um, Bob Marks took me out there to see it last uh, fall, and here's a picture of him pointing at where some of the big old timbers that were probably involved in the head gate, and another picture looking downstream um, and you can tell off to the right is kind of an embayment that uh, fed into the head gate. Two years later, after, a lengthy after lengthy court proceedings, the judge ruled. The May 1916 court ruling was named the Hancock Decree for the name of the Mono County Superior Court judge who made the ruling. Based on the legal precedent, that riparian water rights were superior to appropriation rights. Nearly all rights to Rush Creek water were adjudicated to Kane's irrigation company and his electric power company. This stripped WD's Rush Creek Mutual Ditch Company of all water rights except for riparian water rights on the land he and the Rush Creek Mutual Ditch Company own near the mouth of Rush Creek. But those water riparian rights were of no help getting water into his big ditch miles up the creek at an elevation that would send the water out to the flats below Mono Mills. The, the decree was not appealed by WD, perhaps because he thought Kane's power and influence on judges, agency, and legislators was too much to overcome. California state officials who later reviewed the Hancock decree wrote that it appeared to conflict not only with the facts of the case, but also with the established principles of water law in California. Regardless, WD had to give up his dream of water, farms, ranches, and a town, trading goods and services with the boom town of The agricultural dream based on diversion of Rush Creek was then pursued by J.B. Clover, who bought the Rush Creek Mutual Ditch Company, the Big Shovel, the land at the mouth of Rush Creek from uh, WD in 1918. And this picture is the house that was um, Clover's house. Don't, I don't know if WD ever lived there, but he did live, live there uh, earlier. Clover made the purchase even though there was no water in the ditch and all water rights for the ditch had been lost. He kept digging all the way to a point somewhere between Simon Springs and the lake shore, on the lake shore and Mono Mills. He dug at least one parallel ditch once he was around the north end of the Mono Craters. Some began calling it the Clover Ditch, though it was still the Rush Creek, Rush Creek Mutual Ditch Company. Clover was running a water and land fraud scheme. He was basically saying, I've got a great investment for you and you'll get your water after I stop digging in the ditches. But he just kept digging as proof of intent and had no legal right to fill the ditches with Brush Creek water, though he continued to fight in the courts and even to the US Congress to get that water. Clover was never charged for the full extent of his fraud and never convicted though some shareholders brought civil lawsuits against him. Later review of the Rush Creek Mutual Ditch Company legal entanglements led some government officials to conclude WD acted in good faith in contrast to J.B. Uh, Clover. One investigator wrote, there's no doubt that McPherson and his associates have acted in good faith towards irrigating public lands to be entered under the Desert Land Act. But I'm compelled to ask, is it sad that the Rush Creek Mutual Ditch Company failed? Well, it was certainly sad for my grandfather, W.D., and those who invested in his dream, including his widowed mother. Surely there were some who dis were disappointed that there would 
not be more agriculture, towns, infrastructure, services, and goods with attendant jobs in the basin. But I think we should always be looking at long-term sustainability in the face of human development. Keep in mind that the Kazetika people of the basin had land use practices that were sustainable and that sustained them for thousands of years. If the ditch had been a success, there would have been some negative impacts on these people and on some native plants and animals, such as kutsabi, the alkali fly larvae, harvested on the lakeshore by the Kazetika people and for which they named themselves. They were also called mono people by some other tribes, meaning the fly larvae eaters in those, in those tribes' languages. This is how Mono Lake got its present name. The Kazetika had dwellings and whole villages along Lower Rush Creek and had their own small irrigation ditches for their crops. The creek, uh, the creek water grew native willows and other plants for things like their baskets, dwelling structures, food and fiber. Major diversions of water from the creek by the ditch company would negative, negatively impact all of this. Native species that would have been affected include greater sage grouse, stream orchid along the creek, pronghorn out on the flats, pygmy rabbits, and American badgers. There were two plant species that grow in the pumice flats of Mono County and, not, and nowhere else on earth, the Mono milk bitch and the Mono Lake lupin. And they would have been negatively impacted by agricultural development out there. The introduced species of trout in Rush Creek, rainbow trout and European brown trout, and people who fished for them would have been affected. There would also have been some negative effects on air quality of the basin, as well as the water quality of Rush Creek and Mono Lake. Negative effects would involve the unique Mono Lake brine shrimp in the simple and uh, fragile ecosystem that they are part of, including the mass migrations of waterfowl uh, dining on the, on the shrimp and fly larvae and going back and forth from various distances north all the way to Central America and even South America. Evaporation from the canal, um, transpiration from the crops, and essentially an export of water from the basin in the form of water-laden agricultural products would have caused the lake level to drop, though likely less than the drop caused by the Los Angeles Department of Water and Power's diversion of water out of the basin. What effects on the sustainability of Mono Lake and the rest of the basin's natural components would have occurred from a combination of in-basin diversions and out-of-basin diversions? I don't know, but I think the effects would have been quite negative. Well, WD moved on to a new dream. Establish a pure, purebred Swiss Togenberg goat dairy and combine the dairy with a health resort in a unique setting, Paoa Island in the middle of Mono Lake. The dream included a companion resort on the west shore with boats ferrying everything from shore to the island and back. The very expensive purebred Swiss Togenberg goats that he bought and had names like Prince Bismarck, Mittelzell, Mark Anthony, Fanette, and Geneva would produce milk, fleece, and purebred goat kids to sell to other dairies in the alpine-like mountains of the Eastern Sierra. The LA Times article shown here was a major promotion of the operation, though it called it a goat ranch instead of a goat dairy. And this article is related to who was financing his dream, which I'll tell you about in a moment. WD succeeded in establishing a herd of about 300 purebred Togenberg goats on the island. But he had to keep his expensive purebred uh, goats isolated from the Angora goats that had become feral goats that he and others harvested mainly for meat. In the book, Man from Mono by Lily Matthew Lebrecht, read the remarkable story about her father 14, at 14 years old, George Lebrecht, who with an older man 
survived a boat trip in horrible weather to harvest some of these Angora goats in 1913, at least four years before W.D. took his goats to the island. Frenchman, Frenchman uh, Caesar the Verge, nicknamed Fisher, had placed a herd of Angora goats on Pehoa in the 1870s or 1880s, along with some rabbits and chickens. He apparently never lived on the island, but lived near Danbury Beach on the northwest shore of Mono Lake. The survival of Fisher's goats was some evidence that it was a good location uh, for a goat dairy. Also, there was a productive freshwater well out there that was the result of a failed attempt by someone else to find oil. <clears throat> the well had been drilled years earlier by the Great Western Oil and Development Company of Los Angeles, but it produced no oil. Nor did ones drilled on the northern shore of Mono Lake, despite claims by promoters that the Mono Basin would become the next big oil producing area in the U.S., with boom towns springing up around the lake. However, the well on the island did produce a lot of water. The water was warm, but with only a tiny bit of sulfur in it. So with some cooling, which was very easy during the winter, WD's family had a supply of warm and cool water for people, goats, and farm crops. The warm water and the rich volcanic soil of the island, with that water and volcanic soil, they were very successful growing vegetables needed for the isolated health resort. The 160-acre homestead was in the southwest corner of the island on some of the flatter ground. It occupied about a third of the tan-colored area of Peoha on this map. Before lots of customers could be coaxed to stay, the health resort on the island would double as a sanitarium or place of recuperation for soldiers injured in a myriad of ways in World War I. So how in the world did W.D. finance such a dream? Well, he somehow convinced the very rich man, Otto Freeman Brandt, vice president and general manager of the Title Insurance and Trust Company of Los Angeles to back him. Part of um, W.D.'s contribution would be to homestead on the island in order to get the land for the goat dairy and the health resort. Otto Brandt was part of what was part of the so-called Big Five, who were buying lots of Southern California land and trying to bring water to the San Fernando Valley for agricultural and municipal use. The powerful Big Five included Harrison Gray Otis, owner of the LA Times, Harry Chandler, editor and publisher of the LA Times, Frank Paffinger, treasurer of the LA Times, and General M. H. Sherman. In 1917, W.D. took his wife, Anita, and their three-year-old son, Wallace Raish McPherson, out to the island to homestead 160 acres of land after they lived at the mouth of Rush Creek for part or most of 1915 and 1916. Possibly in that house, but maybe it was other buildings. Uh, that Clover had. W.D. and Benita may have lived in Los Angeles following their wedding in 1913. Their son, Wallace R., was born there in 1914. So W.D. took his family to a nice home and farm buildings he had built on the western shore of the island where, where there was that existing well. They had a nice seven-room house and 10 people total lived there. Um, including Jack Preston of Bodie, who worked for the McPhersons on the island and later on shore from 1917 until the 1960s. W.D.'s Paola Island homestead was a great playground for little Wally, their only, uh, their only child. The homestead location should not be confused with buildings on the southeast shore of the bay containing hot springs and steam vents on the other side of the island from the homestead. There's a whole other story about the sanitarium that was built there later in the 1940s. It became the broken dream of a man by the name of Dr. Barrett, who my father helped by using his 34 foot tour boat to ferry building materials out to the island. 
WD's goat bear, dairy on Paola should not be confused with the goat ranch, also known as the Scannabino Ranch, on the road from Mono Lake to Bodie. In 1919, WD bought a nine ton boat in San Pedro and brought it to Mono Lake to carry anything that was needed between the island resort and the West um, Shore Resort. It came by rail to Benton Station and then over McPherson Grade on a wagon with huge wide wheels and pulled with a caterpillar, caterpillar tractor. He named it the Peoha and it was used as a work boat and excursion boat for many years. It was occasionally pulled up into dry dock below Mono Inn. But it is gone, and I have found no record of it sinking, burning, or being hauled away. It was in 1938 that W.D.'s son, Wallace R., brought the more famous and more beautiful 34-foot um, boat he named Benita to the lake and used it to give tours. He later used it to initiate the harvest of brine shrimp from the lake before it was flipped and smashed by a 1950 windstorm while in dry dock below Mono Inn. Remnants are still visible. WD's dream of a resort in goat dairy was broken in 1922 when the very rich Otto F. Brandt suddenly died of a heart attack at age 64 in a Bakersfield, California courtroom during a court battle over a simple car accident. He got so wrought up, he had a heart attack right there. His heirs, multiple sons and daughters, assessed the bare bones start of the shore resort and the combination goat dairy and health resort on Paoa. They were not impressed. They withdrew financial report, support and WD and Vanita were left with very little capital for construction of the big uh, shore resort. The McPhersons were already spending time on the shore where there was a school for their son, Wally, and with grit and hard labor, they salvaged what they could of the broken dream. Their mono in operation was initially set up by the West Shore Road coming from Bodie through the Thompson Ranch, now Mono County Park. The buildings they used are all gone now, but there was already at least a post office and a store on what was first the Wilson Ranch and then the John Matley Ranch. When I was a kid living there in, in the 1950s, we would play in several abandoned buildings to the north and west of the current buildings between the restroom shower building and the old road coming from Bodie. The three little houses there now, along with the old restroom shower building to the north of, the, of those three houses, were not built until around 1930. Family lore is that uh, WD and family took bunkhouse for the crew that was to expand the shore and island resorts and began to make it a restaurant, bar, and store, adding cabins for guests as they could afford to do so. That old bunkhouse, built largely of lumber salvaged from buildings in the dying town of Lundy, was built uphill from the hay and alfalfa fields next to the new road, being built where Highway 395 now runs through Conway Summit, bypassing Bodie. But that 1922 building is still the core of the present day Mono Inn. Wallace Raish McPherson, sole child of W.D. and Benita, attended a school just a quarter mile north of the inn. That was a tiny schoolhouse long gone that was a predecessor of a schoolhouse another quarter miles north on DeChambeau Creek. After that second schoolhouse ceased to be a school, Family after family lived in it until it was moved to Levining to become the Mono Basin History Museum. Cedar Barger and his family were the last to live there, and he was an early president of the Mono Basin Historical Society. The breaking of WD's dreams in the basin were not quite over yet. He and Vanita were divorced in 1926, and he ended up in Los Angeles via places and projects unknown to me. We know from census data that he was living in Benton in 1930 and in LA in 1940. W.D. died at age 80 in 1952 and is interred somewhere in Los Angeles. It was Benita's wife, Benita, it was W.D.'s wife, Benita, 
who stayed and made Mono Inn into a successful destination resort that she ran for nearly 40 years. She made it into a thriving hotel, motel, restaurant, bar, general store, and gas station with cabins, campground, and restroom shower building down below by the lake. The restaurant and bar are still in business under new owners Hillary Hansen and Tom Jones, a hundred years from the start. Benita R. McPherson is a whole other story about a wonderful, successful, and community-oriented person. Here is a poster that advertised not only Mono Inn, but the boat tours and the winter skiing. The skiing was aided by a number of rope tow ski lifts in Mono County including one that my dad ran on Conway Summit. Being quite a promoter, it was Vanita who started the annual event Mark Twain Days in 1929, a festival held on the lake and land below Mono Inn every year until 1944. She wanted to counter the well-read description that Mark Twain wrote about Mono Lake, stating in his humorous way that it was a dreadful, even toxic place. She became Mono County's first female county supervisor in 1943 and held that office until 1948 and for six months in 1950 by an appointment from California Governor Earl Warren. The homestead on the island never became operational as a health resort. The lovely seven-room house burned down, probably through a trespasser's accident or maybe through arson. I was last out there in 2007 to see the remains. WD's homestead buildings and Dr. Barrett's dome cement sanitarium buildings on the other side of the island are sinking out of history and back into Peoja's volcanic soils. The goats were left to themselves on the island where they uh, actually survived on native vegetation. They were hunted for meat by my father and others and persisted for over 50 years until all were gone sometime in the 1970s. There's been some colonization by mule deer, and not surprisingly, a mountain lion radio tagged by the Nevada Department of Wildlife was tracked to the island where it stayed for a couple of weeks last year. My father, Wallace R., inherited the island property from his mother, but sold it to the LA DWP in 1974 to help pay off debts for putting we three kids through college. Most of the southern half of the island that WD acquired through the Homestead Act and by purchase or other means not clear to me is owned by the LADWP. They are leaving it as is. In the Mono Basin History Museum are many items and a fair amount of information about uh, WD McPherson and the rest of the family and the marks they left on Mono County especially my grandmother, Benita R., and my father, Wallace R. There is also a two-foot by three-foot information panel with photos on the inside wall of the Pioneer Solar Pavilion next to the Mono Basin History Museum. That is all I have for now. Thank you very much, and if there's any questions, please chat them, and Robin, I believe, is going to read questions to me. And thank you so much, Barry. That was awesome. Um, for those of us that did um, hear your uh, discussion about WD at the ghost tour, you really expanded it and seeing the photographs was wonderful. It was, it was great. Thank you so much. Fascinating. Now I'm going to look Very at the welcome. chat. Let's see. Um, where was the shovel in 1990 and how did it come to be at the museum? Ah. I believe it was, in fact, I'm sure it was below Clover's house on Lower Rush Creek. So it was below Test Station Road and um, it was sinking into the stream bank there. A uh, flood had eroded away some of Rush Creek and it sank further. Uh, before it was rescued. I believe that Clover must have brought it there after, uh, you know, his time was over and things were really bust. And uh, he moved the shovel over there from out east of the craters. 
Okay, and then uh, Lee's iPad says, excellent presentation. <laughs> uh, Sanford's iPad says, thank you. Always great to hear, hear learn more about the area. Okay, let's see. David Carl has his hand up. <laughs> ah, David Carl. Hi. Um, so I just wanted to remind everyone, you know, we've, we've uh, shown video of the moving of that shovel and all, and I just want to credit Floyd Griffin, one of the early presidents of the Historical Society, who used to be in charge of the pumice mine, had a lot of big equipment available to him because of that. And I remember when they moved to that shovel, um, first the video we've watched, um, you can see it being lifted by big, big equipment out of the sand, sand pouring down. And then um, they were able to put it on a, a trailer and drag it or, or you know, haul it on a back road, not on test station road, as I recall, a higher dirt road, all the way to town and then put it back together. They took the, the big arm off to, to do the move. So uh, we, we got to remember the work that Floyd Griffin put it, Griffith put into that. Yeah, that's a great video. You know, it's interesting. I asked uh, Heidi and Floyd here not too long ago about that great big map that is in the um, museum that shows it's a that topo map Mm -hmm. where the, I believe it says Clover Ditch Company had created the map. And Heidi said she can't remember how the museum got it. She just remembers how very hard it was to hang it. <laughs> but it it <laughs> must be pretty people. heavy. Yes. She said it definitely indelled in her mind how difficult it was. So Santiago says that he drove through McPherson Grade a couple of years ago went all the way to 120 and he says thank you for a great presentation wow it sounds like maybe there's been some clearing um i think it was maybe late 90s early 2000s uh, my wife denise and i tried to drive it and there was so much brush and rock fall that we couldn't get through with a four-wheel drive you could have done it on foot on horseback or on a on a dirt bike i think but well, that's great to hear that it's usable. <laughs> oh, that's awesome. Let's see. Um, Bob Mark says, this is a great presentation, Barry. Wonderful synthesis, synthesis of all kinds of information, documentation, and family history. Well done. Mm. Thank you, Bob. I really appreciate it coming from you. <laughs> <laughs> mm -hmm. uh, let's see. Whoa, they're coming in fast and furious. Deanne <laughs> says, well done. Have you written articles for Sierra Heritage Magazine or a book? Whoa. Neither. Sorry, neither. <laughs> <laughs> Nor has had, uh, uh, Benita. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, Rich said we had 40 people on tonight. And, um, and yeah. many times that means double because like we are a couple. Uh, Janice Mendez says, excellent presentation. So Barry, thank you so I'd very like to add much. Mind you. Okay, thank you so much, Barry. It was a great, great presentation. Thank you. So You're much. welcome, Frank. <laughs> May thank I ask a verbal so question? Yes, go for it. This is probably a little too complex to write in the chat, but uh, I believe I mentioned that about um, the um, uh, road over Conway Summit that is currently 395 being built, and you said it replaced the original transportation up which went through Bodie. Could you explain that a little more, uh, in i.e. if somebody went from um, uh, the Lee Vining area, the Mono Basin over to Bridgeport, did they end up generally going by way of Bodie back in those earlier days? I, I, I believe in the very earliest days that was the case. From Bridgeport to get to Mono Lake, you went through Bodie. And then there was a new route and it went over Conway and it stayed higher uh, along Mono Lake and that became uh, Highway 395. Thank you. If anyone has any questions, um, please feel free to raise your hand and then we'll 
will unmute you. Well, I, I have another one, <laughs> if I okay, may. Okay, go for it. You mentioned, I may have heard it wrong, that the Clover House that's still sitting, gradually falling apart out there by Rush Creek, may have been lived in first by WD? Am I, did I hear that wrong? Well, WD and Vanita, uh, with little Wally, lived at the mouth of Rush Creek for all or parts of 1915 and 1916. That house may be newer. I don't know what they lived in. Maybe it was just tents. Um, I don't know whether they had a home in Los Angeles still. I think so. And um, so they may have just been up there tent camping while WD worked out on the island. But they lived there, uh, and I don't know when that house was, was built. Well, one of the reason I'm interested is that we have for years talked about a project working with the Forest Service that now owns that property um, to interpret the house for people who are driving by on the road, the dirt road there, and wonder what the heck that thing is that's just behind a barbed wire fence, a chain link fence right now. Um, so we need to, you know, track down whatever is good to say about the the people who lived in that that location. Yeah, and I, I'm glad I found a photo I took not that many years ago before that dang chain link fence was put up uh, around the around the house there. You can't get as near as good a picture now. Okay, and then we got a, a chat from Tim Messick. He says he thinks pre-395, the route from Mono Basin to Bridgeport was through Bridgeport Canyon, Coyote Spring Road in the Bodie Hills. And I think he may be right about there was a road through Bridgeport Canyon. There was, yeah, there was definitely travel through there. And that would have been less arduous than going through Bodie. So he's probably right. As I say, I'm not 100% accurate. <laughs> uh, it's a, it's really um, interesting and fun to hear as the stories are passed down from generation to generation, how they change. And then to have to research and it to, uh, to find these, this uh, information is amazing to me. So thank you very much, Barry. Thank you. And uh, let's see, be yes. Before oh, you faded out a little bit there. Oh, okay. Well, thank you so very much, Barry. We really appreciate it. Uh, mm -hmm. Before we go, I wanted to uh, just remind everyone that next month, March 7th, uh, we're, uh, we have Steve Moore remembering a Bodhi adventure. And hopefully, if, uh, if everybody looks like they're staying well, we'll, uh, we'll have this meeting in person. So uh, thank you all very, as well as Zoom. We will uh, we'll continue to have Zoom so our folks out of town can, uh, can definitely attend. So thank you all very much for attending and hopefully we'll see you next month and have a good evening. Thank, thank you, you, Barry. Thank see you. you next time. Bye -bye. <laughs> see you next month.